Okay, so my name's Jack. I'm a third year medical student at the University of Birmingham. And also for the last year, I've been working as a healthcare assistant in the acute and emergency departments of my local hospital. So I thought I'd talk firstly about what it's actually like to work in the emergency department, the front door, uh, as they call it. And it's fast paced. Uh, it's unpredictable, which um, is, I think, is a good thing. You never know what you're going to be facing when you first get up in the morning. Um, no two days are the same. Um, and that's that's the fun of a job, really. Um, and it's exciting. You know, not every patient's going to be a stab wound or, or a gunshot. Um, but overall, every day you can say is it, fairly exciting with the, the things that you see. No one plans to go into to A and E. It's quite a stressful environment, a challenging environment. Um, but if you if you like a challenge, then it's a department that will suit you. But also that that can be tiring as well for for nursing shifts, and um, they can be 12, 12 and a half hours um, every time. So that's a long time to be on your feet all the time, on the go. There's always something going on. Um, even I remember a really quiet Sunday morning, and we thought, wow, this is unusually quiet and then all of a sudden a nurse comes bursting through the doors shouting there's a woman in labor in the ambulance bay and we all have to run about getting towels and rush into recess and i think that just sums up the sort of unpredictable nature but the, ex the excitement as well that just anything could happen at any moment um and it doesn't always sometimes it can be fairly slow but there's always something around the corner that will keep you on your toes and it can be emotional at times some of the things you'll see can be quite tough, um, quite sad sometimes, especially during COVID when, unless there are certain exemptions, patients have had to be on their own. There's no visitors, no family accompanying them. And often it's been my job in the waiting room to say, look, you're going to have to go now. And then these patients who are already feeling quite vulnerable and scared uh, are feeling even more alone. So that's where the sort of healthcare team has had to step up and, and be that, that second family. Um, for these strangers, really, who are feeling quite scared and alone. And that's what brings the rewarding element of the job. You can say, you can see what you the on their faces, that they, the way they say thank you, you know, that they, they mean it, they're vulnerable, they're scared, and you're there to care for them. So it is an incredibly rewarding um, place to work, as is most places in the NHS, but um, in a and &E, I think you see the extremes of this. So... You might think how the patients arrive in the emergency department. It's not just by ambulance. That is um, the main route where patients come um, if, if, if they need that. Um, for more serious um, trauma, the air ambulance, um, they're, they're all over the country now. The charities, they can bring patients in, the most critically injured patients. Normally, these go to what we call MTCs, which are major trauma centres. So if a patient requires specialist surgery straight away, specialist scanning, they'll fly perhaps slightly further than the closest hospital to get those major trauma facilities. Um, but by the same token, um, GPs can refer patients to the emergency department as well, um, either over the phone or if they've gone into the um, practice, as well as 111, they can decide that this um, that a patient needs uh, emergency treatment, either go to A&E by ambulance or take themselves. And of course, um, mostly patients present themselves to A&E, so you'll go to the waiting room that probably looks familiar, um, you'll sign at the reception, and then you'll be seen by a triage nurse, which should happen pretty quickly. Um, and then there might be a longer wait to see either a specialist nurse or um, uh, an advanced clinical practitioner or a doctor. There's lots of roles that go on um, in A&E. So those are the ways that patients can arrive in A&E. And within the emergency department, there's lots of... Um, different areas that will have different types of patients in different types of staff. And so I've listed some of these here so we can go through. Um, so resus, you might have heard that, casualty or something, the resuscitation room. So that's where the most critically and acutely, so acutely means that it's happened um, quickly, suddenly, um, unwell patients uh, in the hospital really. And you might have heard the terms perhaps hot or cold resus, and that's something that's come to light with COVID. So um, hot, um, um, hot resus will be either COVID patients, um, people who are suspected COVID, people who are a contact or high risk of COVID, they'll go to a hot resus where there's the right equipment, the right PPE for the staff to treat these um, people appropriately. And cold resus 
is for the patients who still need um, resource level care, but aren't at high risk of COVID. And so there's a lower level of PPE that needs to be used for these patients. And then uh, the majority of the department will be the major injury department. Um, so this is normally like a long corridor with lots of cubicles who um, patients aren't on the brink of death, but they're still very unwell and still need to be monitored, still need to have their observations taken every couple of hours or, or more. And so they, we can escalate their care if needed. And then you have your minor injuries department as well. Um, so that's things like fractures and sprains where uh, perhaps a, a nurse specialist might see them or there'll be a doctor covering minors. Um, and then you also have the um, paediatric department, which is for the children. So you might have a little paediatric waiting room, with, um, some toys, and then you'll get um, members of staff who are specialised for paediatrics. So you can have a paediatrician or paediatric emergency medicine doctor. You can have um, children's nurses. Um, so people who spe um, specialise in paediatric medicine, they'll be found in that um, area of the department. And not every emergency department has them. And in the cities, you might find a dedicated paediatric emergency centre. Um, and there's also something called ESTEC, which is, stands for uh, Same Day Emergency Care. So these are patients who might have been referred by the community, um, coming from community hospitals for perhaps a procedure like a lumbar puncture that can't happen in community hospitals that you need a hospital for. And it's um, urgent, um, so it can't be put on an outpatient basis. So that means um, you put on a hospital waiting list, it's quite an urgent thing. So they come to the ESTEC, the same day emergency care center, and then there there'll be doctors and nurses who can perform procedures or do tests and take things from there. It's uh, sort of take the stress off the main part of the emergency department. And then um, a part of any that's obviously been quite busy over the last year um, is the respiratory isolation unit. Um, you can kind of guess what that is. So people with respiratory and infectious diseases will go to this part of a &E. um, And obviously this is where a lot of the COVID patients um, would have gone and currently RIU is um, where I work is our red recess at the moment um, so I was there in the, sort of the peak of the peak of the second wave in January and that was full up and there were ambulances queuing for a long long time lots of patients were either confirmed COVID or contact with COVID um, and that was that was as pressured as it got I don't think we could have gone much more than that because we had record weights of patients and ambulances um, it was quite remarkable, really. So hopefully we never go back to a time quite like that. Um, and then you have another part called the clinical decisions unit. Um, this is perhaps where a patient doesn't isn't in immediate danger. Uh, they might not immediate, need immediate care. They're just waiting for a review from a consultant, perhaps, to see where they're going. Can they be discharged? Can they go to further on in the hospital? And then finally, of course, you have the waiting room. Um, that can be like a a cage of hungry lions sometimes because no one wants to be there. Everyone's tired and hungry and thirsty and impatient. And so perhaps they're not as polite as they would be in their everyday lives. Um, you might see frustrated patients at the wait times. So you have to go into that sort of environment, remembering that if people are a bit mean to you or perhaps speaking to you in a way that's not very nice, but it's not a reflection on you. It's more the situation. These people are, no one expects to go into A&E. No one wants to end up there. Um, so perhaps they're not in the best spirits when they do talk to you. So that's something to bear in mind when you're in that kind of environment, especially as a student, but not everyone's going to be up for a, a chat. Everyone's quite distressed and vulnerable. And so that's something to bear in mind in any part of a hospital, really, but particularly in the emergency department. So where do people go after A&E? Well, there's lots of um, routes that they can go. So depending on the problem, they can either have a medical admission or a surgical admission. So medical admission is something where they go to a medical ward, something like cardiology, um, or they might have a kidney problem or um, a chest problem, something that might not need surgery, but will need medical care, or um, some procedures or further examination. Whereas a surgical admission might be things like um, some trauma, broken bones, um, pain, appendicitis, those sorts of things that might require surgery. So they'll go on to either the surgical um, admissions unit and then onto a surgical ward higher up in the hospital, perhaps. Um, or if um, a patient's been treated and their problems no more, they can just be discharged home. 
perhaps with some leaflets and aftercare instructions, um, and that can be the route for them. Or perhaps they can be discharged, but they need to be follow up, um, followed up perhaps in a fracture clinic um, or something like that, or be referred to a specialist service that come in at a later date, but they don't need the emergency care anymore. Or they could be, uh, they could need a community follow up, so they might end up um, back with their GP to see how they're doing at a certain time. Or we might uh, need a specialist centre and might need to be transported for there. So um, the hospital I work at is quite a small town general hospital, um, but they might need a specialist, for example, cardiac heart intervention. So they might need either driving or flying up to um, a bigger specialist centre for, for their problem. So that's where they could go after that. Um, so those are, there's more, but those are the, the main routes where people go from A&E. Um, so we're going to have a listen now to a couple of job roles. So first, we've got um, a paramedic, Rohan, who's going to talk to us a bit about his roles. But I just need to take put myself on mute for a second. Um, otherwise, there'll be feedback. And then after this video, there'll be a, a video from an a &E doctor as well. So I'll just put myself on mute first. Hi guys, my name is Rohan. I am a paramedic for South Central Ambulance Service. I work on double manned ambulances with a crewmate. So my crewmate could be either an ECA or an emergency care assistant or a medical technician. So I'll just quickly explain the roles because um, I feel that people don't actually know what the roles are in the ambulance service and that not everyone's a paramedic. So an ECA does or in SCAS does an eight week course. So it's a four week full time blue light driving course and then a four week uh, clinical course in a classroom learning about the ambulance, uh, basic life support and how to assist a paramedic. So more often than not on an ambulance, you'll have a paramedic such as myself and then emergency care assistant who assists us, um, can pass us things, set up stuff and then they do most of the blue light driving. Um, an emergency medical technician or an AAP, which stands for an associate ambulance practitioner, is sort of your next level up. So they're classed as ambulance clinicians, but they're not, um, they don't have a registry body. Um, so they can give some life saving injections, such as adrenaline in um, anaphylaxis. So like an EpiPen, which pretty much um, we all can can do but they're, they're able to draw up this drug and give it and they can make clinical decisions um, and that's a slightly longer course I believe it's about an 18 month course to being fully qualified as a technician. Um, so just a bit about how I became a paramedic so I did my A levels um, at sixth form I did a science based um, A levels so I did biology I did psychology and I did sports science, which is just a private school worth for PE, basically. Um, I then qualified, I, I then uh, grad, uh, finished college and started um, in the ambulance control room in my gap year and working in the control room as an emergency call taker, taking 999 calls, um, which involves taking the phone call, triaging the call, so asking the caller loads of questions and then arranging the most appropriate ambulance response for them, whether it be a high priority response um, for a cardiac arrest or a patient having a seizure or a lower priority response, maybe for someone who might have broken their arm, broken their leg or had a fall. Um, and that was a really good stepping stone for me. Um, I did it for about eight months full time then I went on to a bank contract. Um, and, it, and I think it's really set me up um, for being sort of the paramedic that I am at the moment. Um, I then went to Oxford Brookes University and started a three-year degree in paramedic sciences. Um, it gives you a BSc or a Bachelor of Science. Um, and nowadays, to be a paramedic, you need a BSc. So it's either you go to uni, you do a three-year course, or you look for an ambulance trust who will pay for your internal progression so you start working for the trust as an ECA after a few few years you apply to go on the student program and then you'll pay to do the route internally up to the point where you can apply for your BSc and basically it's like an apprenticeship and it's actually quite a good route because I see more urgent care patients but we do occasionally see a patient who's really unwell 
and it means that we can use all of our skills that we've learned at university. So for example, um, we can do advanced airway interventions. So as part of your primary survey, A, B, C, so airway comes first, um, we can place airways into people's mouths to help them breathe when they can't breathe for themselves. We can do IV access, so intravenous access, putting cannulas into people's arms. We can also do IO access, which stands for intraosseous, which means drilling a large cannula into bones, so either on the shoulder or just below the knee. Um, that is mostly done in cardiac arrest, where people's veins just aren't there because their heart isn't pumping enough blood around. Um, and it's a very quick and easy thing to do. So if the heart is beating, but it's not beating properly in, in a um, way that can deliver blood around the body, then we can give amiodarone and it helps put the heart back into a more stable rhythm. Um, another one, for example, is atropine, which helps speed up the heart rate if it's dangerously low. Um, we can give diazepam um, when a patient's having a seizure or we can give TXA when patients having a catastrophic bleed. So we can deliver all these drugs, all these interventions on route, on the move. Um, and it's definitely an element of the job that I really enjoy. It's all about thinking outside the box in this job and being logical, having a lot of common sense. Um, and it's very, it's very rewarding. When you... So that's our big sick patients. And we take them often to A&E, resus, or if our little sick patients, we often leave them at home or refer them onwards. Um, so my favorite part of the job is probably um, the fact that I can go to someone's house and treat them. I find that quite um, a bit of a privilege. We tend to work in people's own homes, thinking outside the box, delivering quite high level treatment to them, um, almost hospital level treatment sometimes, um, on the roadside, by their bed, anywhere really. So um, in, the, in their cars, for example. So I find that it's an extra element of the job um, and I really enjoy that. And I enjoy being out and about. Um, if the weather's rubbish, you do get wet if you're outside, but it's part of it. And sometimes if the weather's nice, you spend your whole day outside and it's, and it's really nice and you're not stuck in the hospital. Um, so that's why I chose this career. Um, so yeah, if you've got any questions, I'm more than happy to take your emails. Um, but I hope you found this useful and good luck with the rest of your careers. Hello, hi, I'm Dale Kirkwood, an ST3 emergency medicine registrar, currently halfway through training at the Royal Preston Hospital, which is a major trauma centre. Uh, MTCs are regional hubs that receive the most seriously injured patients, having all the specialists required to deal with the initial management of any injury, from car crashes to explosions, falls downstairs or off cliffs. Um, the first two years of emergency training is called ACCS or Acute Care Common STEM Training, which comprises of six month rotations through anaesthetics, intensive care, acute medicine and emergency medicine. And this provides us with the foundations and core skills to deliver the vast majority of emergency care for adults, children, physical and mental health issues, the full shebang. I myself am still a way off and still need to hone these skills and over the next three years I'll be running de emergency departments overnight and leading teams and developing these skills further, dealing with uh, you know all various problems that come my way or the team's way and then also work under consultants who will help build us up. And However, even once you're a consultant, there's still so much learning to be done. You know, medicine is truly a dedication to lifelong learning and um, emergency medicine is much more than what you see on TV. You know, it's not just CPR and blood flying, yet flying everywhere. Um, we are trained to, train to deal with uncertainty, risk and undifferentiated patients. And it's these grey areas which you might be surprised to find that often some of the most taxing. You know, we're trained to rapidly stabilise critically ill patients and help establish what's going on before they go to point of no return. But there's a lot of problems that come into the emergency department that aren't so easy to work out. And that actually is uh, a real challenge and, and, and one of the things that takes years of experience to, to, to really finesse. Um, so, uh, you know, this involves a lot of problem solving under pressure, people and resource management. 
and it's mobilizing what is available to you to quickly get a sick patient diagnosed and treated with the help of our specialist colleagues. Um, sometimes all we provide is reassurance and simple self-care advice to people who are worried. And um, I myself trained in Leicester. Um, it was the only and last medical school to upset me. Um, I jumped for joy and cried with my mom basically when I found it. It was a thin letter, I thought it was a rejection letter. Um, I couldn't believe it. Uh, I used to tell myself people like me don't become doctors. You know, I was embarrassed to admit I would try. Um, I, you know, grew up in a, you know, a traditional working class household and didn't know really any, you know, senior professional management healthcare types at all within my family or kind of in my community. Um, so I was really worried they'd ask questions like at the interviews like what books do you read and I was either going to have to make it up or you know or admit that wasn't really my thing and I would like to say you know medicine does take all sorts um, it's an absolute dream and the opportunities to make a difference go far beyond what you know I could ever imagine and still do to be honest um, so yeah enjoy the rest of the conference work smart and uh, best of luck take care Those are really um, <clears throat> interesting insights there from both doctor and a paramedic. Um, so if you've got any questions for me or we've got um, George in the chat as well, um, for anything about working in the emergency department, um, a career in emergency medicine, about any of the roles, um, just pop them in the chat now and we'll, we'll stay on for, for the next few minutes and, and answer any questions that you've got. So we've got some in the chat already. So I think George had answered that one. Do you have to be a qualified doctor to be a paramedic? No, it's um as he says, it's a standalone qualification, um, uh, that you can do a separate uh, degree for. Now, either going to do the three year route at university, or you can find a trust that will pay for your um training, and you can work and earn as you do your degree as well. So there's that route. Um, as working in a as a HDMA, do you want to be? a par um an a e doctor it was actually the other way around that i was um i was interested in emergency medicine before i worked as a healthcare assistant and that's why i took up the job in in the emergency department um to try and help make up my mind and it was um is everything that i thought it would be um it's fast paced it's really exciting it's challenging um and it needs to be a certain type of character to deal with some of the things you you see um but there's there's always support there for you um, you'll be part of a great team um, so it's definitely a career that i want to pursue um, is it difficult to be a paramedic uh yes <laughs> but um any any role in the nhs will have its difficulties and challenges um, i think paramedics are fantastic just purely for the conditions that they work in and um, working in a hospital in a nice sanitary environment there's always uh, people to help you Full of experience there's always someone higher up you can go to and talk to but as a paramedic a lot of time you'll be out there um, on the road on your own in very challenging conditions weather outside on a motorway um, and then trying to perform um, procedures and, and give care in that environment is very challenging and so um, they're, they're uh, very well trained and, and very skilled to do what they do but um, it's difficult but it, it looks like a very rewarding career um, are there any emergency nurses? Um, so you can get um, specialist nurses who can work in the emergency department. Um, you can also get um, advanced practitioners who are perhaps um, regular, what we call band five nurses who've um, worked for a few years and they've gone on to do extra training um, to be able to um, take a bit on a bit more responsibility in the department. So seeing patients, triaging, um, carry out examinations, recommending care. Um, so they're, they're, you can go quite high up as a nurse. And obviously um, you can become a sister or a ward manager. And those often start out as um, regular staff nurses. So there's lots of pathways in emergency medicine for, for nurses, as well as pediatric emergency nursing as well. So lots and lots of jobs available and training. Um, how can I get experience in emergency medicine? This is quite a tricky one because it's not really an environment that allows for um, 
perhaps 16 to 18 year olds to come in and get some experience in quite a fast paced environment where a lot's at stake. So there's not really room for perhaps younger unqualified students. Um, so that is quite a difficult one. Perhaps contact your local hospital. Um, find is a lot of it is who you know unfortunately is a lot of it is in medicine um so if there's any way you can get into a hospital in general um, any contact in there get in touch with them um or uh, do a lot of reading watch videos documentaries um to show your interest and, and that can be just as valuable as work experience um and look out for volunteering as well because that can be a way to get into hospital i managed to, to get sort of work experience type thing in a e by doing volunteering I and mean, then if you show, if you work hard at your volunteering and you show you've got an interest in emergency medicine, then they're more likely to show you around, let you see things, talk to you, give you tips. Um, so you have to be creative about it rather than it being handed to you. So it's, it's quite a difficult area to get um, work experience in. Um, competitive is emergency medicine specialty. Um, I think most specialties are undersubscribed really, um, but it's sometimes not seen as an, an attractive career for medicine because of its constant shift work. It's unfortunately people don't break things and hurt themselves nine till five. It's it will require night shifts and um, evening shifts. And I think George is just trying to get in here. So I'm thinking he'll have something to add. George. Sorry, I just thought I'd join. Um, now I'm freed up off the stage to answer any of the paramedic related questions, but carry on, Jack. You're doing fantastic. Really, yes. So, um, I think, uh, yeah, if you work hard um, and you don't, you don't choose especially straight after medical school, you do a couple of years of rotations um, and then you go and choose your specialty. So there's plenty of time to prepare and build up your portfolio for that. But um, if it's something you want to do, I definitely say go for it. Um, is assault against paramedics common? Um, I'll hand that one over to George. Thank you, everybody. Um, sorry, I'm a bit late joining this one. Um, Jack's done a fantastic job there, um, hosting the emergency medicine session. My background's in the paramedic profession. I've just finished my paramedic degree. Um, so I'm currently awaiting my registration as a paramedic with HCPC. Um, so in terms of assault against paramedics, I think that varies and it's very hard to say really. Uh, it can vary depending on the area. Um, that you're working in and and look to an extent you know we all go to different jobs um, and we deal with one job at a time and unfortunately um, some of the patients that we go to can assault us it depends in what way we'd consider assault whether that be um, verbal assault you know that can be fairly common or physical assault is I believe thankfully less common um, but it does still happen uh, I think it's worth remembering that we're dealing with all spectrums of the public um, so we deal with people that have perhaps got um, certain mental health conditions or that may be under the influence of um, a drug that that could um, have sort of a psychoactive effect on them sometimes that you know people will um, react differently to our care as a result of some of those things it, it can be as a result of anything so it's 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 too common i don't think it should happen at all um, and it is a shame i've never been assaulted i've been in positions that um have have led me to sort of eye up the nearest exit, you could say. Um, but I wouldn't say that's something to stop you considering it as a career. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. And the sort of in hospital um, is obviously quite a, a little bit more of a safer environment, but people, um, especially as you said, if they're under the influence of things, either be it drugs or alcohol or withdrawing from something, um, they can become confused and that causes them to act perhaps aggressively. Um, but you always put your safety first and if you think you're putting yourself in immediate danger in a situation then then you have to get yourself out otherwise you're going to make yourself another patient and that's just not a good scenario to be in so um absolutely one of the things that we're actually taught throughout the degree um, when we're preparing for OSC is so the practical exams that we do is we follow a doctor CABCD approach so as Rowan said you know we do the primary survey looking for catastrophic hemorrhage airway brain circulation but the first thing we look for is danger and if there's any danger to ourselves, you know, the colleagues that we're working with, or the members of the public, or even the patient can sometimes endanger themselves, then that's the that's the first thing that we consider above anything else. Yeah, definitely. So can um virtually some medicine paramedics use drugs to stabilize somebody uh, mentally 
um, and not just physically. Um, so certainly in hospital and, um, and pre-hospital as well. Um, so a medical doctor can prescribe um, perhaps sedative drugs, um, like things like diazepam or, um, or things like ketamine to try and kill pain, but will also um, sort of calm the patient down and uh, make them less distressed and also unable to remember uh, a traumatic situation, um, which is good for their uh, psychological recovery as well as their physical recovery. Um, I'm sure George will know a bit more about what um, paramedics can offer in terms of in terms of that sort of thing. Yeah, um, I suppose it depends what, what perspective we're looking at. I mean, nowadays, paramedics work in all sorts of different areas. So we've got paramedics working in GP surgeries and A&E and in intensive care, for example. So, you know, the, there's a broad spectrum. But from my perspective, working on road ambulance, there's definitely things that paramedics can offer in terms of, you know, drug management patients with mental health issues um, the trust that i'm in we have paramedics on multiple levels um, so our advanced paramedics can use sedative drugs um, so if we've got somebody who um, is is particularly agitated as, as a result of any of the factors that we've mentioned including you know a mental health condition that they may be um, struggling with at the time then they can be sedated to keep them safe um, that doesn't mean asleep it just means to calm them down slightly so that they're not putting themselves or other people at risk. Um, from my perspective, we tend to deal with people in the acute setting, so we wouldn't be prescribing something in the long term, as Jack said, the doctors would do. Um, it's sort of a, a short-term fix to, to keep somebody safe um, and deal with the immediate problems, and then we'll, we'll consider the ongoing um, treatment plan after that. Um, so what A-levels would you... Uh, recommend doing so this will um, differ for paramedic science and, and medicine um, so for medicine for the majority uh, if not all of medical schools you need to do a level chemistry um, and most um, will require you to do a level biology as well um, now the third one is up to the university so you'd have to check their individual pages but um, sometimes this can be maths and that sort of was the traditional one but nowadays um, it's almost I, I think better to have something slightly contrasting from biology and chemistry, your sciences, to try and give you a bit of a broader knowledge um, and uh, something a bit different from the science, bring you back into the real world. So I did um, A-level government and politics, and obviously with the NHS and politics, they're kind of interlinked, so I found that really useful. So as long as you have your biology and chemistry, the third one in the majority of places will be up to you. Um, and I'd also add there's not much benefit in doing four A-levels over three. It's better to focus on three and do them really well. Um, I'll let George talk about the, the roots into the sort of paramedic science. Cheers. Um, I definitely agree there, quality over quantity with regards to the A-levels that we do. It's better to do something really well than try and do, you know, too much and do them to a mediocre level, I suppose, when it comes to exams and courses. Um, a lot of universities, paramedic science courses, um, would like you to have had chemistry or biology um, as an A-level or equivalently you can, you know, get your UCAS points through um, BTEC, for example, so health and social care, those sort of courses can be used to build up your qualifications towards an application to the paramedic degree. But ultimately, this should be checked on a, on a university to university basis. Um, it is worth mentioning, actually, that I didn't do any science A-levels, so I did history, photography and English literature. I wanted to be an architect up to a late point, so I sort of um, followed academic A levels in the arts with history and literature, and I'd done photography just because I enjoyed it. And and I think we need a bit more of that in the world, um, doing things because we enjoy it. So you can get into the paramedic profession, you, you know, with with different A levels. I think look on the university websites and on the UCAS website um, for more information. Um, but generally, yeah, don't don't let the A levels that you've done hold you back or think that it's not worth applying. Um, we've done you know, obviously a paramedic science degree myself, and I've enjoyed the science, I haven't struggled with it, um, particularly because I didn't do science-based A-levels. Um, so definitely don't let that hold you back if you haven't done science A-levels. If it's something that you're interested in, then go for it. We do do a lot of um, anatomy, physiology, pharmacology, um, pathophysiology, for example. So there is a lot of elements of chemistry and biology into in the degree, so it might be helpful to do that. But and it's not always essential. That's a really good point. There's not even, especially even for medicine as well, um, especially in recent years, there's, there's other routes you can do. Um, 
so you could do a different degree first so you could do maybe a biomedical or biology degree first and then do medicine as a second degree as well you, it's important to remember you don't need necessarily straight a's or straight a stars um my offer for medicine was abb um simply because the school i went to where i live um family history of university that sort of thing so they do take those things into account nowadays so that's important to remember when when you're thinking of where to apply and if to apply at all um and then as was asked is biology a necessity for medicine in general i'm interested in picking geography chemistry and maths um there are for most places biology will be a necessity um i'd say if you're interested in medicine doing a level biology will help for a lot of for all the human biology that you do um yeah, so even if it's not a requirement, I definitely recommend it because biology, obviously human biology is part of that and doing that will show you've got an interest in it. If you applying to medicine, you haven't done any human biology, um, they might question us why that was. But you can get away with doing geography, chemistry, maths, that's, that's what you enjoy. There are places that will let you in. For some reason, it's chemistry that they really want. Um, and I'm three years into a medical degree and I can tell you I've not really used chemistry at all. I think it's just because it's hard, but it's just one of those things. It doesn't make sense. There we go um any more questions we miss uh, there's a couple of general ones are you oh here's a new one um is there a certain routine that you adopt to make sure you are treating the person holistically or is that the job of another doctor to attend to their needs other than just their physical problem um so I th yeah with, with any patient at any time you, you try to go holistically you've got to remember this is a person not just a set of symptoms or signs or a problem and a lot of the time looking holistically will help you find the root of or cause or how to help their physical problem so if they come in uh, with problems from alcoholism then don't just treat what's going on with their body look at why are they drinking how can we help them do that um, and especially I, I think from a paramedics point of view when you're in there um, their home is their environment. You can find out how they manage. Do if they've fallen over, do they start needing uh, care packages? Um, so I think paramedics definitely have a, a really important role in that situation because they'll often be in that social environment where they are, um, and so they're in a position to recommend um, uh, potential avenues of care. So I'm George, sure George can tell you something about that. Yeah, I think I mean emergency care in general, but especially from the perspective we're we're quite privileged really we have a very unique view of the patients quite often we're the first point of contact in their healthcare journey and we'll be seeing them in their own home or their own workplace so it's a really um, you know we're trusted a lot to go into those environments and having a holistic view is is as Rowan said you know a, a lot of our job comes down to common sense and that's crucial in, in evaluating people's social situations um, and certain aspects that may affect their health that you perhaps wouldn't think about and that comes with experience you're not gonna you're not gonna be aware of those things on your first week out on placement for example but for me now coming towards the end of the degree well having finished the degree coming towards starting work as a qualified paramedic you get used to um, taking that sort of broad broad look at things so that's yeah I think that's crucial for us and I think you know as, as Jack said in a and &E, even you know acute care in general we have to we have to have that broad, holistic view of everything um, to really consider all of the all of the possibilities. Yeah, that's a really good question, I think. Um, so how do you look after your own mental health when you have um, a difficult case? Um, so that's a really good one. I think in sort of acute emergency medicine, um, uh, especially pre-hospital, you can see some pretty shocking things that most of the general population would just never experience, never see, hear, smell sometimes. Um, so uh, looking after your mental health is really important. I think uh, my advice will be to just talk it out with whoever will listen, whether it be a colleague who's in the same thing, um, someone in, who's there to support you in the hospital, a mentor, um, family, friends, obviously you have to be careful about patient confidentiality, but just talk to them about what you're struggling with. But, um, just don't bottle things up ever because they'll just get worse and worse and worse. And if you're in an environment where you have to see tough things, you need to find your own healthy ways of coping and not turn to anything that's not going to be good for you. So yeah, my advice would just be to, to talk it out with 
where they feel comfortable with. Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree with everything there. And I think it's just important to remember that something that works for one person might not work for another. And there's there's no right or wrong way to, to deal with these things. I mean, we do see um, things that other people wouldn't see. And, and quite often, I think it doesn't happen all the time. It's not like every day we're seeing awful sights, but I've been in situations where I've gone for weeks and weeks and everything's been fine. And then I've had one shift where I've had job after job of traumatic incidents and things that, you know, the general population probably don't even know goes on in society. And we do see those things. For me, I like cycling. I like going out for some exercise, getting fresh air. Um, that's, that's how I choose to deal with these things, but there's no right or wrong way um, for a certain you know, for, for one person versus another. Um, but it's definitely something to take into account. Um, you're going to see these things in any area of healthcare. Um, and, and looking after your mental health, it, you know, it's a long term game. It's absolutely crucial. Um, someone's asked Is the rate of burnout the same as in other medical professions? Um, or is there a different trend? I think. Um, Obviously, there'll be actual facts and figures on this, but um, sort of colloquially, I think that might be slightly um, um, high because it is a difficult and challenging place and environment um, to work. But I'm not sure on the exact numbers, so you'd have to do some research on that to get the exact thing. But I would say it's a perfectly doable career to have a place to work if you've got those healthy coping mechanisms, those people to talk to. Um, realizing when you need help and if you do all of those things then you should avoid burnout recognizing when you're starting to get burnt out yourself and there's a lot more support out there um, than there used to be I think um, and for particularly difficult cases I think most areas of emergency medicine do things with sort of debriefs where you come together as a team um, and you just talk about what you've seen um, and try and make sense of it and then people can offer some more support in that situation so there's a lot more that goes on to try and combat the burnout um i think george will know a bit more about it. i know that uh, the ambulance services are quite quite hot and debriefed for difficult yeah, situations yeah. definitely and the culture <clears throat> with for that is evolving massively you know i mean it, it, since i started a degree even the way that we deal with traumatic incidents has changed we have something called a, a hot debrief which is where immediately after the incident we will go and we'll offload anything uh, that we feel is necessary but quite often at that stage you can be a bit dazed if you see something that's really not very pleasant um uh, and we'll be followed up after with the offer of a trim assessment which is like an assessment of um whether we're having any concerning effects from that or whether the way that we've reacted is normal sometimes you can have bad feelings after seeing something bad but it doesn't mean that, that that's not normal you know seeing bad things is going to make you feel bad and that doesn't have to be a negative thing necessarily it's how you deal with that um so yeah i think it's the culture is definitely evolving i think one thing in in avoiding burnout is what you're expecting so i'm, I'm aware this is one of the most popular sessions of the day um and emergency healthcare in particular seems to be very popular amongst you know student doctors student nurses paramedics etc um and quite often people have this image that it's all you know the sort of things that you see on, on a drama on the television and it isn't you know the majority of the job is is social work it's mental health it's um, dealing with elderly patients we've got an elderly population and i think that it's not just seeing bad things that could contribute to burnout it's having an expectation that the next job might be the big car crash or you know something awful that you see on the television if you if you're just if people go into it with a realistic view, I think of what the reality of the job is like on a day-to-day -day basis, and that's one of the key things to me in avoiding burnout. I don't really know if that answered the question, but um, no, that is that is a really good answer. I think yeah, it's, it's just about dealing with with the burnout better, um, and you'll avoid it. So any figures that you might have seen from years ago, that's not really relevant nowadays. There's a lot more things in place um, in all areas of the NHS. Um, so we should do a couple more questions because. Uh, nearing the end of the session how long is the degree so for medicine um it's a five-year degree if it's your first degree and if you've done a degree, be a degree before and you're doing it a graduate route then it's and those five years uh, first two years will most often be um, in the university 
studying your anatomy and physiology. Um, and then your last three years will be in the hospitals on placement and um, learning on the wards that way. Um, and that's generally how most medical courses are split. Uh, yeah, for the, for the paramedics, it's generally three years now. It's changed a little bit. So it used to be through a diploma, which was two years. However, as Rowan mentioned, the most common way into it now is by doing a three year degree. Um, it can be four years if you did a foundation year. So if you qualify for that or that's a way of helping people in it's part of that widening participation thing um, sort of initiative, then then some people can do an extra year to, to get into the, the mode of studying at, at university level. Um, the paramedic course, I suppose, is quite unique because we go on placement almost from the start. So within six weeks of starting the course, I did my first placement um, and you're, you're getting into that healthcare environment straight away, which is fantastic. Um, but yeah, generally three years. Um, it's hard work. You know, the holidays are shorter than most degrees because there's quite a lot to fit in. We do the equivalent of a three year degree plus a year and a half worth of placement, you know, a few thousand hours of placement. Um, and that's that's a good split as well. We, I, in my degree, I did 60% of placements were on an ambulance um, where we'll see anything and everything. And 60% were in hospital, so we'll cover maternity, anaesthetics, uh, surgery, emergency medicine, um, paediatrics, like all of the things that we might have to see on, on the road as a newly qualified paramedic um, and further down the line as specialists. And also, you know, we have a lot of different skills with people's airways, with examining people so we go to different areas of the hospital and specialties to learn that as well so it's a very varied degree um, I suppose medicine healthcare in general is going to be varied okay if there's no more questions we can uh, wrap it up there thank you everyone for, for sticking through to the end um, it's a fantastic challenging uh, rewarding but crazy sometimes area of healthcare um, but it's, it's worth it if you put the work in. Um, so thank you for George for joining me and helping me answer some of those questions. It was really helpful. Good luck everyone um, yeah. with the rest of your careers and thank you. Thanks for having me, Jack. And thank you thank all. You.